Welcome and greetings to all. I am Shen Long Pen Dragon, the Lore Master. As always, my usual disclaimer I do not own any of the images or the story in this video. The credit for these all belong to their original sources. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me today. I hope that you, your friends, families, colleagues, etc. are all doing okay in light of the current events going on. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all the key workers that are continuing to work hard to keep up not only the UK but other countries as well uh, afloat during this crisis. So a big thank you to all of you, especially if any of you are currently listening or watching this video. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to um, ask you to join me in a few moments of silence for the uh, people who tragically lost their lives uh, to the ongoing pandemic and for the uh, families that continue to suffer due to it. Uh, so we will commence that in three two, one. Thank you. So on a brighter note, ladies and gentlemen, this is the second video of my Great Battle series. I've been wanting to do this for a while and I finally have the opportunity to do so. I apologize for the delay in getting this to you, uh, I'm sure you can imagine there has been a lot going on recently. I know it's been a few months since my last video, but uh, unfortunately life does take over. So here we are, and let's move on. So ladies and gentlemen, as you saw from the title, I'm going to be doing the Battle of Sekigahara, which is arguably the most famous battle to have occurred in Japanese history pre-World War II. Now, uh, obviously many of you will likely know the events of this battle, some of you may not. Uh, I will be going over the background, uh, the battle itself, and a very very quick overview of what happened afterwards. The battle itself uh, took place on the 21st of October 1600, and it took place between two different factions which refer to as the Eastern and Western Armies of Japan. Uh, you'll see a bit more about that in a few minutes. So without further ado, let us get on and discuss what actually happened. So ladies and gentlemen, the image that you're seeing here is of the Japanese warlord Toyotomi Hideyoshi, sometimes known as the Great Unifier. Hideyoshi began his military career as his master's sandal bearer, his master being Oda Nobunaga, the very famous warlord and one of Japan's most iconic figures. Nobunaga essentially built up his clan from scratch and actually seized control of almost the entire country, almost becoming shogun. However, in 1582 he was betrayed at Honaji Temple. His body was never found and it's not exactly known what has happened to him, it is assumed that he died during the incident. By this point, Hideyoshi had risen through the ranks and had actually become a general in his own right, being venerated as a samurai. Hideyoshi decided to take it upon himself to avenge his master, so he essentially subjugated uh, the army and, in fact, eventually defeated and even killing Odonoba's own son in the process. Eventually defeating the betrayer and gaining control over the vast majority of the country, he was able to set up a power base and earned himself the name, or rather, he earned himself the title of Taiko. So the image here is of Osaka Castle, which still stands, to, or at least some of it still stands today in Osa modern day Osaka. During his time as the Taiko, um, he essentially was able to take control of the courts and dominate all Japan, bringing much of the other clans to his name or to his cause and for essentially about 27 years or so it was a good time for Japan, it was a lot relatively peaceful, there were no civil wars ongoing. However obviously peace doesn't last. Hideyoshi was never satisfied with just being the Taiko. 
although it was a great honour, what he truly wanted was to become Shogun, or some form of Emperor. Now the Emperor at the time was unwilling to, or yeah, I should say he was unwilling to give him the title of Shogun. The reason for this is because Hideyoshi was born peasant, and only, sa only true samurai could become Shogun. In a ditched attempt to prove himself to the Emperor, and also potentially to name himself as true Emperor over all Asia, Hideyoshi launched a very, very disastrous campaign into Korea. In fact, he launched two campaigns into Korea. Both were defeated. I can't speak for the first one, but I know that the second campaign was actually led by his general, uh, Ishida Mitsunari, who we'll see later on. Obviously, the peace in Japan could not last, and eventually, the Taiko died. This left a massive power vacuum, and a big question as who is going to succeed him, as Hideyoshi's heir and son was only a boy at the time, far too young to take control and become the Taiko. So, as you can imagine, the Taiko's death left a massive power gap. Uh, which needed filling. Two major players began to rise uh, through the ranks of the Council of Regents, who was essentially the governing body of Japan in the absence of the Taiko and the Shogun. The first of these was to the uh, Tokugawa clan. So the man that you see here is Tokugawa Ideyasu, who was the clan's leader. Ideyasu was starting to get middle-aged by this point, but he was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most senior member of the Council of Regents. He was also arguably one of the most cunning and smartest generals uh, Japan had ever seen at this point. Uh, he was one of the later ones to have actually joined uh, the Tokugawa in their conquest, having originally actually been a vassal of Oda himself previously. Ideyasu had always been uh, well respected by the other vassals of the Oda, and he very quickly rose to the ranks in the Toyotomi, actually even defying and fighting against the Toyotomi initially, in, in some cases actually defeating them. However though, he knew that he wouldn't be able to stand up against the Toyotomi for long, and allowed himself to be awarded a strong position within the court, rather than being de completely defeated and his clan being wiped out. So the second faction were primarily made up of Toyotomi loyalists. Uh, now these loyalists had the stronger political power in the country at the time, even though Ideyasu was the president of the Council of Regents. The reason for this is that many of the loyalists or many of the other sort of clans were very mistrusting of Ideyasu, believing him to be either too powerful or simply just seeking, uh, believing that he sought power for his own gain and wanted to become Shogun. So ladies and gentlemen, the leader of these Toyotomi loyalists was in fact Ishida Mitsunari, or at least he was the most senior political figure at the time. You could argue that the uh, true leader was uh, the Taiko's former mistress, Lady Chacha, or Chacha-sama as she's sometimes called. Uh, Chacha was in fact the mother of the heir apparent, however she was not Hideyoshi's um, wife, she was in fact one of his concubines, or rather one of his consorts as I should say to use the correct term that the Japanese used I believe. Uh, please do correct me if I'm wrong there. Despite having lost disastrously in Korea, Ishida still had a fair bit of influence, and he was able to gather a lot of political support from the Toyotomi loyalists. There was also quite a lot of people that were very hesitant to pick sides. Most of these were the uh, regions and clans which had converted to Christianity, as by this point the Jesuit priests from Portugal had been able to secure quite a strong foothold in Japan at the time. In fact, the Jesuits were very, very political. They played on both sides, primarily through trade and through religious conversion. Uh, however, their power was not to last, and I can do a second video on the Jesuits in Japan if you so wish.
Uh, if you'd like me to do that, please leave it down in the comment section. So, as you can imagine, the power struggle started to escalate. And unfortunately, war looked like it was going to become not only a real possibility, but inevitable. So, growing tensions from the country beginning to take serious sides as to which faction they wanted to align with. This map is showing you, at the time of the battle, what clans and regions were aligned with what faction. So, the red is the Eastern Army, led by the Tokugawa, and the blue is the Western Army, who is led by the Toyotomi Loyalists, aka Ishida. The yellow is a bit of an interesting one. Those are the ones who decided to defect from one side to the other during the course of the battle. Now you'll notice there's a sort of purple region in the middle. I'm not exactly too sure what this region donates. It could be that this area was neutral or just simply just did not take any part of the battle at all. So as you can imagine, as both sides gained influence and uh, lost influence on a practically daily basis, the tensions between them started to mount higher and higher, from being politely civil yet mistrusting to practically open hostility. Eventually things would escalate and through a series of events, uh, it's actually believed that Ishida tried to have members of the Toyotomi, specifically uh, Idiasu himself, assassinated. While I'm not sure if there's any hard proof of this, it's widely accepted that this was a part of the outcome. Eventually, the real war began when the Uesugi clan, who were renowned as very powerful and very warlike, uh, having been the rivals of the Ta Takeda clan, which by this point had unfortunately been almost completely wiped out by the Oda clan, the Takeda, it's worth knowing, had basically been assimilated into what their former vassal clan, the Sanada. And the Sanada basically now ruled uh, a significant portion of the old Takeda regions. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, uh, forgive me for that tangent, but moving swiftly back on to the actual story itself. Eventually, the Oesugi basically started to publicly denounce some of the uh, hostile-like actions the Tokugawa were taking and believed themselves to be in danger, so they started amassing weapons, armour, and building up their forces. Idiasu himself denounced this action, uh, claiming that this was denying the Taiko's wishes and inciting war rather than peace, and he demanded that the Uesugi stopped. They responded by more or less insulting him uh, and his honour, claiming that they were just preparing themselves to defend and that if anyone was going to break the Taiko's peace, it would be Idiasu himself. Not wishing to let the insult stand to his honour, Tokugawa actually did in fact did, uh, declared war on the Uesugi. So, marching from Edo, one day Tokyo, the Tokugawa clan and their uh, close-knit allies actually attacked the Uesugi. This was the spark that Ishida needed to finally destroy what he believed to be the rebels of the Tokugawa's peace and to ensure that the heir would take up the mantle of the Taiko and that the Taiko's wishes would be fully granted as Ishida himself and Tokugawa had promised the former Taiko on his deathbed. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're still with me, uh, we're now moving closer and closer to the actual beginnings of the battle itself. So let's take a look at the troop strengths and the uh, at the beginning of the battle at least. So first let's look at the Eastern Army. Their initial troops were approximately 75,000 men, however the troops at the actual start of the battle itself, or at least part way through the battle, was uh, approximately 88,888. 
The exact number of casualties they suffered during the battle is unknown. However, none of their side actually defect, uh, defected during the battle itself. Now let's look at the Western Army's uh, numbers. Their initial troops started at 120,000 approximately. However, at the start of the battle, or at least uh, uh, during the very early stages of the battle, where they started to have a lot of defections, they numbered about 81,890 approximately. While their exact number of casualties is unknown, uh, some of the estimates uh, come up to potentially around 30,000 casualties. Uh, this may seem quite high, and in reality, yes, this is a very high number, but again, it is only a rough estimate. Some other estimates put the number at closer to 5,000 or even maybe 500. The exact number is not known. It is known, however, that approximately 23,000 of their troops defected during the battle or at least decided to refuse to take part. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're still with me just now, uh, listening and watching the video. I'm now going to quickly talk about the um, initial campaign and then the actual battle itself. The reason why I'm not moving straight onto the battle is because the campaign is actually very very important, or at least the initial campaign is, as to what happened at the battle. Uh, the image that you see in front of you is actually a painting depicting at least part of the Battle of Sekigahara where you can see the different standards of some of the different warlords and clans that took place, or at least that took part, during the initial fighting. So, as you can imagine, uh, with any battle, or with any campaign before a big battle, there were several skirmishes that occurred between the two factions. Arguably, two of the most famous of these occurred at Fushishimi Castle and Gifu Castle. At Fushishimi Castle, the uh, general, Tori Murotada, who was an ally of the Tokugawa, was able to put up such a strong defence that he actually delayed Ishida for 10 days. Being unable to move for 10 days, as I'm sure you can imagine, during a very, very mobile campaign is not good. So Ishida was unable to provide any support to Gifu Castle or to attack Tokugawa's rear or his stronghold at Edo. These 10 days would cost Ishida massively, as one, it started to cause him to lose confidence, or at least his generals to lose confidence in him, and it also uh, gave Tokugawa plenty of time to finally break through Gifu Castle. Gifu was essentially, and I do hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, please let me know if it's actually pronounced Gifu instead. Um, Gifu Castle was essentially the doorway or the gateway that would allow the road from Edo to Osaka to be opened. Osaka Castle was still the primary stronghold of the um, Toyotomi clan and it's also where Ishida had basically picked to uh, make his primary stronghold or at least the faction's primary stronghold. Unfortunately during the skirmish at Fushishimi Tori Mototada was indeed defeated and did indeed uh, die. It is recorded that he, him and more or less his entire clan, or at least his entire force, was wiped out. But it still played a massive role, and you could say in all retrospect, although they lost the battle, it was in fact their victory because they achieved their objective of holding Ishida up, which, initial, which would prove to be a valuable uh, point for the Tokugawa campaign. So ladies and gentlemen, the actual battle of Sekigahara itself. As you can see from this chart, Ishida had set up his forces in a very very defensive orientation, hoping to block the advancing uh, Eastern Army's uh, attack on Osaka. Sekigahara was very very well placed, it was very strategically defensible, so Ishida was very very confident in the way he set out his forces, believing that there was no way that Tokugawa would actually be able to break through, especially as Ishida himself had the numbers advantage. So the battle itself began when uh, the Tokugawa general uh, Fukushima Masunori led his advance guard 
along the Fuji River and struck against the West Army's right center. Iyasu uh, saw this as an opening move and thought it was his chance to launch straight into the attack, so he sent more forces to support Fukushima's attack. However, this was a very, very dangerous ploy by the Tokugawa. They were hoping to break through the lines, uh, mostly through one, a very, very quick, very, very mobile strike. However, Tokugawa did have other advantages up his sleeve. He'd been in contact uh, for months previously with many of Ishida's generals and other commanders, hoping to try and get them to defect to his side. Some had promised the defect, others were hesitant, and some had outright refused. But Tokugawa was confident that the ones that had promised him that he would that they would defect would join him at the critical moment. Seeing that the Tokugawa flank and that Idiasu's position itself was actually exposed uh, during the attack, Ishida ordered one of his generals, Shishimu Yoshihiro, uh, who in some popular cultures known actually as the Devil of Satsuma. So he ordered uh, Yoshihiro to actually attack, but Yoshihiro refused, believing Ishida to be an unworthy commander. Now as you can imagine, samurai were very very proud and it was notorious of them to only follow the strong. If they believed the commander of the army was weaker than their own lord, they would not obey, especially as service to your own lord always came first. Yoshihiro being a daimyo, uh, he decided that he was not going to risk his men and lives for a man he thought was unworthy, so he refused to move and essentially just held up his position. Uh, this proved to probably be a very, very fatal move for him as his forces were eventually attacked by one of the other Tokugawa generals and he was forced to flee. Um, his own nephew was in fact killed during the... Uh, Yoshihiro forces retreat. Uh, yeah, so unfortunately that was not probably not a great ploy by Yoshihiro, but moving swiftly back on to the actual track of the battle. So one of the other Western generals decided to attack instead. This was Otani Yoshisugu. Otani was renowned for being very very clever and very very tactical. He'd seen that Fukushima had disposed his flank during the attack and so rushed his own forces in to one help support the other forces that were currently being attacked and two to try and break the Tokugawa attack and then counterattack straight into their lines. Things didn't seem to be going well for sh for, for, uh, for my apologies. Things didn't seem to be going very well for Fukushima at the time as he was now getting very very heavily pushed back and starting to take some pretty heavy casualties. However, this was where one of the key defining moments in the battle took place. One of the other generals, who was actually stationed on Mount Matsuto behind Otani's lines, was uh, and I do hope I pronounce this correctly, this is, to me is a very very difficult name to pronounce, uh, Kobiyakama Hidekai. Now Hidekai had promised to defect to the Eastern Army side during the battle, but he remained hesitant. Uh, now the exact reasons for his hesitancy I'm not entirely sure, but I believe one reason why he was very very hesitant to defect was I think he had a connection to the former Taiko or at least the Taiko's son by blood. I think he was in fact the Taiko's nephew or rather the um, heir's uncle or some form of cousin potentially. Exactly how they're connected uh, by family and whether or not they actually truly are connected by family I can't for life me remember. Uh, if somebody does know then please do feel free to comment in the uh, comment sections below. But anyway moving swiftly on. Hirokai's uh, hesitancy began to really enrage Iyasu. The man had promised the defect, yet he sat up on his hill and did absolutely nothing for a significant length of time. Growing impatient, Iyasu actually ordered his Archibus Corps to march forward and open fire on Hirokai's position. Now, I'm not entirely sure if my audience, if you know what an Archibus is, but if you don't, 
it's essentially a bit like a musket or a rifle. It's a uh, almost like a handgun, very early sort of development, which had been brought to Japan from Europe uh, by the interactions with the Christians. So both sides actually had archivists, it's worth noting. So with an archivist fire upon Hidekai's position, you'd probably think, what is Tokugawa thinking? Uh, surely this would convince Hidekai to stay with the eastern, uh, rather stay with the western army and actually attack the eastern army rather than defecting. But the strange thing is, Hidekai actually did defect. Uh, the very, very bold move by Tokugawa was to remind Hidekai of his promise and to actually force him to make a final decision. Are you going to defect and uh, come to me, or are you going to remain my enemy? Hidekai chose to honour his promise to Tokugawa and actually attacked Otani's rear. Otani himself had actually set up his own arc of his court when he saw the betrayal. Hidekai's attack proved completely and utterly ineffective, or at least the, char the initial charge did, as the Tani's Archibus Corps fired into them. Taking heavy casualties, Hidekai's 16,000 men had to slow their advance, but did keep advancing. When they finally met with Otani's lines, Otani now suddenly found himself completely outnumbered and starting to seriously lose ground very, very quickly. This was the turning point of the battle. Seeing that Otani was now on the defensive and losing, many other commanders and generals who had been hesitant and sort of swapping sides in deals decided to defect. Among the number was Wakasha, uh, well, I'm probably going to absolutely butcher these names, but I'll try anyway. Um, uh, Wakizaka, uh, Yashiharu, Ogana, Sukatada, uh, Azuka uh, Nayosan, and uh, Kutsuki Motus uh, Motusuna. Again, ladies and gentlemen, I probably have absolutely butchered those names. I do apologize. Uh, I'm afraid I don't really speak very much Japanese other than a few words and phrases, and I always find a lot of Japanese names quite difficult to pronounce at times. Anyway, moving very swiftly on. Otani was actually then forced to beat feet and make a complete retreat. Uh, this essentially caused Ishida's right flank to fully collapse and uh, Fukushima and Hidekai's advances essentially rolled up and completely dismayed the entire right, uh, well not just the right flank but basically most of Ishida's forces at that point. Seeing that he was now critically in danger of losing the battle, Ishida retreated to Mount uh, Nagu, where the Mori clan forces, led by Kikikawa, uh, Kikikawa again, I'm probably pronouncing that horribly wrong, uh, if you want to see where all these forces were actually stationed, you could have a look at the um, chart on the, uh, or rather the previous image, hopefully that you can get some information of that if you so desire. Moving swiftly on, uh, the Mori clan had actually refused to enter the battle earlier, uh, say, with uh, Kikawa actually saying that he was busy eating at the time and uh, he didn't really want to move his forces while they were, well, while they were eating and digesting. This ploy was actually a very, very strategic move by the Mori forces as their very, very deadly rivals, the uh, Chosekabe clan, was positioned more or less right behind them. By maintaining their position, they prevented Chosekabe from deploying his forces into the battle, and essentially Chosekabe was stuck. Uh, he was no position to attack the Mori, he, he was outnumbered by the Mori, and the Mori had the high ground, so attacking them would have been a really poor choice at the time. So, Ishida rode up uh, to the Mori forces to ask them to engage and save his army. However, Kikikawa refused to support Ishida and essentially kept the Mori forces where they were. With now the vast majority of the support gone, his right flank completely uh, destroyed and, he ha and without any further forces to deploy, Ishida knew that he was defeated. So he ordered a retreat and uh, tried to run for it. 
However, he and several other of his uh, loyal generals were captured, and Ishida himself was actually later executed. So as you've seen from this, this was a complete and utter devastating defeat for the Western army. And although I've put it down on this uh, image here as a Tokugawa victory, because it was primarily really the Tokugawa's campaign, the Eastern army em emerged with a decisive victory. The road to Osaka was now clear, and uh, Idias's ambitions were more or less completely untouchable at this point. So what exactly were Tokugawa's ambitions? I will be covering that in just a minute. I'm actually now going to cover something else which you may or may not find interesting. And on that note, I really do hope that you do find it interesting, otherwise there's not a lot of point in talking about it. What I'm now going to be talking about is what I'm calling here the side battles, which is where the later rivals to the actual battle of Sekigahara come in. Now, both the eastern and western armies had uh, forces that they were unable to deploy because they were otherwise engaged during the time of the battle. Let's have a look at the first one. The image that you're seeing here is... Um, Obviously, a very, very nice uh, image with the cherry blossoms and the castle in the background. That castle is Ueda Castle, which was the stronghold of the Santa clan. So, many of you may be thinking, what was the involvement of the Santa, as they actually weren't at the Battle of Sekigahara itself? Well, hold up in Ueda Castle, uh, many of the Santa had actually sided with uh, Ishida, whereas other members of the Santa had actually sided with Tokugawa. Uh, you'll probably think, w why was this occurring? Why was the clan divided? Well, the clan leader had decided to side with Idiyasu because he felt that that was the best point for his clan and as his role. His second son, whom is one of the most famous samurai of all time, Sanda Yukimura, also decided to side with uh, Ishida. Mostly because he had met, met Ishida before. Uh, Lady Chacha, whom you remember, uh, was in fact his friend, a cl relatively close friend, and he didn't want to betray her. Also, he had several other uh, friends and comrades who were taking part of the Battle of Sekigahara, who were loyal to the Western Army. So he sided with, uh, chose to go with his father and sided with the Western side. However, the heir to the Santa clan, the firstborn son, Nobuyuki, in fact sided with the Tokugawa. Now you may think, this is incredibly interesting, why would the eldest son not follow the bulk of the clan and support his father? The reason for that is that he was actually married uh, to the daughter of one of the very, very, very strong retainers of the Tokugawa. This was Hon uh, Tatadakatsu Honada. He was actually married to, Tata uh, to uh, Honada's daughter. I apologise for stumbling there. So Nobuyuki decided to side with his uh, with his father-in-law uh, rather than with his actual father, and take part on the eastern side. Rather than causing division in the Sanada clan, or rather, I should say, rather than causing animosity, this seems to have been actually approved by the clan leader. Now you may be thinking, why? Why would um, he approve of his sons picking sides and not siding with him? Now, here's the interesting thing. The Sada were well known for deception and very clever tactics, switching sides, uh, backstabbing, and overcoming the odds to survive. Because they were so low in number, they really didn't have much of a choice but to try and play both sides until they achieved an outcome which would be strong for their clan. So, in that regard, the Sada thought probably by dividing their forces in such a way they would ensure that at least one of the eldest, one of the sons, would survive. It be either Nobuyuki or Yukimura, depending on which one. Now, y Nobuyuki was actually present at the Battle of Ueda Castle. Exactly what involvement he had during the battle, I can't say. I don't know if he was anywhere near the front lines or not. But regardless, he was actually there at the battle. And as you can imagine, he probably wasn't keen on attacking his own family. Either way though, everybody did their job and the Sanada emerged victorious uh, from this conflict and Hidata was massively held up and unable to support his own father at the Battle of Sekigahara. As you can imagine, 
Idiasu went was pretty peeved off at his son when he'd have finally arrived at the aftermath of the battle, having lost the vast majority of his forces to the much smaller Sanada clan. Exactly how uh, Idiasu reprimanded he did that, I have no idea, but uh, I can tell you a little bit more uh, about the he has later life uh, in a few minutes. So the image here that you're seeing is Tanabe Castle, where the second of these sort of battle side battles took place. This was held by 500 Eastern Army men, led by General uh, Hosokawa Yusai. Now Yusai was a very, very well-known general throughout the country. He was, although old at the time, he was very well respected, and the 15,000 Western Army troops that were moving against Tanabe Castle were so awe-inspired by this general that they were fighting this absolute legend of a warrior and commander that out of sheer respect, they actually slowed their own advance and seemed unwilling to engage with the um, general and his 500 men at the castle. In the end, this completely slowed down the um, Western Army's pace and prevented these 15,000 men from actually taking part in the Battle of Sekigahara. Now, as you can imagine, if either these 15,000 Western Army troops or those 38,000 uh, Tokugawa troops had actually taken part at the Battle of Sekigahara, the events that did take place could have been quite different. For example, some of the defectors may have switched to the Tokugawa side instantly, having seen just the sheer number of forces that the Tokugawa had brought compared to Ishida. Or it could have been that they decided not to defect because of these additional 15,000 troops, and uh, the battle could have ended in Ishida's favour. Either way, the battle ended in a complete and utter devastating defeat for the Western Army, and a very very decisive victory for the Eastern Army. In terms of the aftermath of the Battle of Sekigahara, there were other political movements and other battles that took place, but overall the Tokugawa spent the bulk of the time solidifying their power for the next three years, with much of their uh, enemies uh, either dead, captured, or uh, in some form of exile. During those three, uh, rather at the end of that three year period in 1603, Emperor Go, uh, I do hope I pronounced his name correctly, uh, Go Yose uh, named Tokugawa Ideyasu as the first shogun of the Tokugawa or Edo shogunate. After his death, Hidata was actually named as the second uh, shogun of this line. However, he later absconded uh, for his, in favour of his own son, who became the third shogun. It's very, very widely recorded in literature that Hidata absolutely hated the job. He found it very stressful, he found he had very little time for his family and for managing the clan itself, and overall he just really did not like the job. So it was pretty clear that he had absolutely no intention really of becoming Shogun at all, but uh, he was the heir at the time, so he did take up the role. Uh, in terms of later campaigns in Tokugawa Ideyasu's later life in terms of the aftermath and securing his power as the Shogun. This led to the um, Osaka campaign both winter and summer. There were actually two separate uh, campaigns or battles for Osaka Castle. This point in history for Japan really saw the end of the Toyotami clan as it was uh, and in fact led to many many sort of political upheavals. This is also where the uh, warrior I named earlier, Sada Yukimura, this is where he really earned himself his title of the greatest soldier in the land. Now I am considering doing another series of videos called The Warrior Saints, which is where I will list the names and deeds of various warriors throughout history, uh, some recorded as myth, others as actual real heroes. Uh, Sanada Yukimura would definitely be among those that I would actually do. If you think that's a good idea or if you like the sound of that series then let me know in the comments section and I will definitely get on that for you guys. 
Um, otherwise, let me know if there's something else you would prefer I did, like if you would prefer I did other battles, or if you would prefer that I did other sort of different series, then again, do please let me know. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening and joining me today. I do hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, then please remember to like and subscribe for more lore, myths, legends, and stories. I'm uh, not too sure which battle I'm going to do next for this series, I'll have a think about it. If there's a specific battle you have in mind that you would like me to do, then please leave that down in the comment section, and I will be more than happy uh, to cover that story as well. Uh, in terms of my uh, Chinese series, which I started uh, a couple months ago, which the first video was on the Dragon Mother, I hope you all enjoyed that one. Uh, the second video for that I'm going to be doing is the story of Nuwa. Now, if any of you don't know her story, and or if any of you do, then I really hope that you look forward to seeing that video coming up, hopefully next week, I hope, though I can't make any def uh, definitive promises. In terms of when I might do the next uh, for this series, I'm not too sure. Uh, one other video I've definitely got planned coming for you guys though, is because I know it's been mentioned a couple of times when I did the Scotia video, is that I'm going to do the story of the Stone of Destiny in Scotland. Uh, I hope that sounds interesting to you, uh, let me know in the comment section if you want or don't want that. Again, I don't know when I can uh, get that video out to you guys, maybe in a few weeks or so, um, we'll see how it goes. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're doing okay with the ongoing crisis that the world is facing. Uh, if you're currently in lockdown, I hope you're, that you're staying safe and that your families, colleagues, friends, etc. are all managing to stay safe as well. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you very much for joining me today, and I will leave the video there. Once again, I am Shenlong Pendragon. Until next time, knowledge is power.